Hello, I'm LaTanya Turner. As you've just seen, navigating the current food environment and achieving a balanced, nutritious diet is a challenge, but it can be done. There are external factors impacting the way we eat. Now we'd like to examine what we can do to improve our relationship to food. I'm joined by a group of experts that recognize the value of nutrition in healthy growth and development. They are Megan Morden, Executive Director of Community Food Advocates. Leslie Speller Henderson, Program Leader for Family and Consumer Sciences at Tennessee State University. Courtney Grimes Cuden, a psychotherapist focusing on the treatment of eating disorders and Director of Programs and Outreach for the Eating Disorders Coalition of Tennessee. And Dr. Leanne O'Brien, a pediatrician with Capstone Pediatrics and Fellow of the American Academy of Pediatrics. Thank you all for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you. I want to start by talking about the concept of malnutrition. What we just saw in the documentary talks a lot about our dysfunctional relationship with food and it seems to result in malnutrition, but not the way we typically think of it. So I'd like for each of you to tell me how you see malnutrition manifest in your work. A, a lot of the work that we do at Community Food Advocates is with kids in public school. And so we interact with community, um, community school health and the teachers and parents and kind of trying to figure out strategies to help children make healthier choices on the lunch line. Mm -hmm. um, more and more kids are having issues with obesity um, and with that energy levels that relate to how they can learn in the classroom. So I would say that that's how we kind of see it as not just an eating issue, but really a learning issue. Okay. Leslie? In the world of family consumer sciences, which is formerly home economics, but it's family consumer sciences for the last 20 years. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's been a while. We look at consumer issues. So the whole family relationships revolving around food and how you interact with food and how you interact with people. So it gets the whole bigger issue around food and food access and, and eating and eating behaviors. And does it start, you know, in human development at zero in the life cycle and lifespan? So it's an interesting uh, dynamics for food. Okay. Piece. Courtney. In the world of eating disorders, you see a lot of self-induced malnutrition. Folks with a mental illness where they either fall way far on one end of the spectrum and underfeed themselves or way far on the other end of the spectrum and overfeed themselves. Um, both are equally dangerous. And so in my line of work, I aim to educate and advocate uh, consumers and patients on how to sort of fall in the middle and practice normal intuitive eating. Okay, Dr. O. Um, well, as a pediatrician, I try to help kids get the healthiest possible start and encourage breastfeeding. Um, even if you can't exclusively breastfeed, some moms go back to work really early, but any breast milk is better than no breast milk, so I start out that way. Um, we try to avoid adding foods um, too soon, um, and we definitely try to avoid having uh, children started on sugary, um, artificial foods. Um, I think. Uh, most children actually have a very good sense of the right foods and how much to eat. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of foods that are in their environment uh, can kind of overcome their, their natural instincts and they end up um, eating poorly and becoming um, malnourished because they're eating the wrong foods, which then they feel hungry too soon. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't have the right balance of fats and proteins and carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. um, that they would get if they were allowed to actually um, select from a healthy uh, choice of foods. I, from listening to you all, what I'm hearing clearly is that malnutrition is not a certain look, that mm -hmm. our, our image that might come to our minds of a skeletal body or big bellies, uh, mm -hmm. children with big bloated bellies or anything like that. It can be, look very normal uh, mm -hmm. to many of us. So what is it? What? Let's start with you, uh, Dr. O, because you mentioned vitamins. And is it about vitamin deficiency that may not even show up if you look at someone? Um, most children in this country can get adequate vitamins um, from their foods. It is a little harder, especially especially in certain places where there's not the access to fresh fruits and vegetables. And um, for picky children, I do recommend vitamins. For exclusively breastfed children, especially African-American children, vitamin D is essential. And um, we are supposed to get vitamin D from sunshine, but especially in the winter months and even in the summer, we don't tend to be outside as much as we once were, so we have to get vitamin D. Um, other vitamins, it sort of depends on the child, but I try to get the vitamins through their, their food choices as opposed to taking vitamins. 
Courtney, do you want to add something? Because I would think the folks you work with are really good at concealing what they're Very good doing. at concealing, so. yes. Um, secretive behavior is a hallmark of disordered eating. Um, as a matter of fact, m most folks who are disordered eating or disordered eaters or who suffer from an eating disorder are of an average weight, average body size um, to the naked eye wouldn't arouse any suspicion. Um, the relationship with food is what becomes very secretive, and what's become uh, very powerful, it's what becomes very disordered. Um, when, when people tend to give power to food to dictate a sense of self-worth, to dictate um, a position in society and sort of dictate to you how you move around in the world, that's when they usually uh, mm -hmm. end up in in my neck of the woods. Okay. Did you, did either of you want to add something just about the image of mal malnutrition? Yeah, and, what, and I know. guess a little bit to speak to what she was just talking about in a lesser degree, it's it's everything that we talk about with school nutrition is that there is a power to being able to buy the Cheetos. Mm -hmm. um, it means you have money. And so there's a lot that's associated with access to certain kinds of food, particularly junk food in schools, um, that has a lot to do with who you are and whether or not you're able. And I know in high school and middle school, we get to those numbers where the participation in school lunch and breakfast really drops off, even though eligibility for those programs is still very high. And a lot of that's related to stigma and not wanting to be seen as somebody who's low income. So you don't want to get in the line that makes you get the hot meal. You want to get in the line that lets you get the Cheetos. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's something that kind of plays into all of the way that we deal with food, which is, Absolutely. I just had that like moment Absolutely. of realization. Yeah, <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. Was, that comes to mind that in the consumer issues, um, when people come to this country as refugees, first generation mm -hmm. Americans eat different than their parents mm -hmm. because school environment, food environment, television environment tells you how you're supposed to eat. So if you never had a hot dog, you, you'll have a hot dog if you're a mm -hmm. child, you grew up in America because television says a hot dog is okay, for example. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with hot dogs. Mm -hmm. It's what we put with the hot dog that causes all the challenge. And so it's an interesting, mm -hmm. how do you make good food and bad food, or is it just food and food access? And we come to a lot of that mm -hmm. which causes issues. Mm -hmm. Bad food, I'm on, food, free and reduced lunch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Children whose parents give them money can buy whatever they want. Mm -hmm. And so then you say, oh, well, I have money. I don't want to use free and reduced. For example, I know of children who want to have the free and reduced because full price lunch costs more. Mm -hmm. So I can get the mm -hmm. free and reduced guys ticket and I can have their lunch because they don't want to have it. And I don't know why they don't want to have it. So it's an interesting mm -hmm. unbalanced malnutrition mm -hmm. on how we're eating. It's very interesting. And it also has to do with control yes. and, and who's controlling what. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of what you're talking about is consumer marketing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and how much of this relates to controlling what you eat and being able to control um, with certain programs such as SNAP and other mm -hmm. programs and even school lunch programs. Sure. There's a sense you may not can control some of the, the options you have. A lot of that has shifted in the past couple of years and we were very lucky to have a farm bill pass this past year that actually puts a lot of emphasis on farming and farms mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. um, we were lucky enough as an organization to get a grant to provide access at farmers markets for people on SNAP. Mm -hmm. And now 10 markets in Nashville do that every week that they're in, in operation during the summer. Let and me interrupt you just quickly yeah. and define SNAP for our viewers who may so not know what that SNAP is. SNAP is formerly food stamps. Um, it is an electronic benefit transfer card, just like a debit card. Um, you can only use it for food, um, which is, a, there's a lot of myths around that. People think you can buy all kinds of things with it, but you can't. <laughs> um, but the emphasis on allowing access for SNAP customers at markets, um, is, it really, opens the door for farmers markets to pop up in neighborhoods that normally weren't available to them just because the money is there now. Um, but it also provides farmers who are some of the lowest income people in our communities um, to have access to customers that they wouldn't have had otherwise. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a win-win um, in terms of connecting those dots. And what's interesting, and um, I have a program that compliments Megan, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. called SNAP-Ed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. SNAP is Supplemental, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, and I have the education piece of that. Mm -hmm. So um, our job, ed educator's job, is to teach people who are on SNAP to make their food dollar stretch further. Mm -hmm. So then how do you, if you don't traditionally go to a farmer's market, what would I get there and how would I cook it? 
and the And this is skills. a fairly new possibility for a lot of the these programs, right? With the they used to be more limit, mm -hmm. limited mm -hmm. in choices, uh, not necessarily well, access choices. For maybe? Farmers markets, farmers for sure. Markets. Yeah, because okay. you know, people who are on SNAP are accused of buying anything and mm -hmm. everything, and, and my my uh, tax dollars is getting that grocery full of soda pops and everything else, which is like the First Amendment, freedom of speech, freedom of choice, freedom of everything. And mm -hmm. I watch TV. Why can't I get that? Mm -hmm. And then we say, well, I don't have SNAP and I don't buy like that. Well, do you watch TV also? So it's an interesting standard we put on people. If you get SNAP, you can't buy what you see in the grocery store. Mm -hmm. Or how, do you, how are you taught to eat? And so that's a very big mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. um, and and some of it has to do with the dollars in the pot, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's cheaper to buy some of those yeah. products. It is. Well, and get... we, with food access, I know Leslie will agree with me and we one of the the things i say kind of as an anecdote about snap in general is i have a neighbor um who has three sons and a daughter none of them can drive he's disabled he's on disability he's raising them by himself they live a mile and a half from the grocery store they all walk together mm -hmm. to go to the grocery they all carry groceries back and when you see what they buy you really understand why they make those choices um, you know, a bag of pretzels or a bag of chips it's weighs lighter. less than a bag yeah. of apples. Yeah. 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 And yeah. so we're, we make value judgments yeah. about people. We stigmatize them, but we're not walking in their shoes. Yeah. Yeah. But Literally. you also seemed like you Literally. wanted to challenge that mindset a mm -hmm. bit, yeah. Leslie. I do. So go ahead and <laughs> yeah. do that because you don't completely accept that they're kind of boxed into service. Right. No, there because is Because there, there's a cart you can use that has wheels. Mm -hmm. that, well, you can put all your groceries <laughs> really? in with you for a mile. And then, well, the, the blocks is called exercise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you can exercise with your eating. Yeah. We talked about walking to a store in East Nash in East Tennessee earlier mm -hmm. and walking to the store to, to buy the treats you want is a good idea because then you eat it while you're walking so you're burning mm -hmm. the calories. Mm -hmm. So it's a it's an interesting balance. What about I the cost into. factor though? Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about that because mm -hmm. I mean <laughs> well just a little bit because yeah. I mean I've heard that the the dollars often are spent three weeks into the month for people on these programs. Now that may not be about choices, that may be about funding, I don't know. Well, it's it's about the fact that, that that number has not increased for years. The so number? The number, the allotment that people are getting. Mm. Uh, it hasn't risen with the cost of food. Mm -hmm. And as our food costs more, um, you're gonna see yes. people not be able to make those dollars stretch. And I think that uh, Leslie probably knows this too, that it, healthy food is not that, exp you can buy it, 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 but it is a matter of being able to access it fairly. Yeah. And I think that that's the real key component there. So what do you tell the mom who's got the, the SNAP uh, benefit, has three kids, and is two and a half weeks into the month and her, her dollars are almost done? First, we have to overcome the myth that I have this money, I have to spend it right away. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. the biggest challenge. We get it, I gotta spend it. So that's why you see the grocery store, people with two carts mm -hmm. full of food. It lasts on your, the benefits last the whole month. Mm -hmm. Or better yet, it's good for so <laughs> three it's budgeting months. a it little is. bit. Budgeting, and that I want you to shop for a week and not for, mm -hmm. um, I gotta fill my pantry up to get food back in it. Mm -hmm. And that's the biggest challenge, getting people to, getting them to say that it's a week, I need you to plan your menus, see what you already have, see what staples you have and buy toward those. Okay. Um, and that's the biggest challenge. And so then if you're eating week to week to week, it lasts four weeks as opposed to three. Okay. And I've been challenged on that. Uh, <laughs> Leslie, if I have $5, I'm getting ramen noodles and hot dogs again, our friend hot dogs and my family eats well. I said, yeah, for one day. Mm. I want you to think about it for a week. Mm -hmm. And then they're like, oh, mm -hmm. yeah. And you said something earlier very interesting about rice and beans. Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. That's poor yeah. people's food, you know, right? Mm. <laughs> well, it's a traditional food um, in a part of Africa that I lived in, and everybody looked really pretty healthy there. Everybody was, you know, was there wasn't really a lot of malnutrition, um, except as we talked about the toddler occasionally that got knocked off the rest by the next mm -hmm. baby coming up. Mm -hmm. Um, but I talked to my families and when I asked them, what are you going to have for dinner? Even some of the families where like they're vegan and this, that, and the other, and they're like, I don't know. <laughs> and it's mm -hmm. three hours from now. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of times, um, all that planning, um, that's not something that's high on the list. Um, and it is really the, I mean, to have foods that are inexpensive, but healthy, most of those foods are a little more labor intensive. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, um, you know, that's where people run into problems, I think. Um, 
does the, um, does the consumer marketing also drive us to think that those are the better choices to some extent, oh, yeah, unless I'm you're sure. really Absolutely. well informed about this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anybody? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I like to joke about how um, in our family growing up, all the recipes started with a can of Campbell's soup, oh, you know, and like my, you know, my mother and grandmother's generation were really told that um, it was better through science, that, mm -hmm. you know, they mm -hmm. couldn't make it as good as that. And so a fun challenge has been going back and trying to t turn that very um, soup based uh you know, canned vegetable-based chicken pot pie into something that's fresh again. Mm -hmm. um, and realizing it doesn't take as long and actually cost a lot less money, but it's the learning hurdle. Um, so I think that we are taught that what we give, and this ties into breastfeeding as well, is not as good as what we can get off of a shelf. Mm -hmm. Why do we seem to look at marketing food differently than marketing? I mean, a lot of moms and dads set limits for, say, how many toys a child can have in a certain brand. I won't mention any mm -hmm. particular sure. brand. But if it comes to the fast food kitty meal, mm -hmm. you know, we're more likely to give in. But we'll say, no, you can't have another doll or you can't have another building toy. Yeah, I think a lot of parents, um, they just want their child to eat and be fed because that's their job. And now they're done with their job because yeah. they've There's provided. guilt associated with limiting <laughs> that as opposed to another yeah, doll. Yeah, I mean, and if, if they work hard and produce something that then ends up going down the garbage disposal, then, you know, their job was not done well. And, um, and I've had that happen occasionally. I've tried to make, you know, um, you know, a fresh tomato chicken stew thing, and it just sat in the fridge. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And um, it's hard. I mean, it really is. I mean, generally speaking, um, you know, we cook at home and we eat at home most of the time. We don't go to fast food restaurants. But when my kids were little um, and I was kind of lonely, I mean, going to McDonald's and going to the little play area with the other kids was something to do. And I think that we need to have places like that for healthy restaurants. We need to have play areas for kids and opportunities to do fun things associated with healthy food, not just with, you know, junk food. Junk food. And you, you know those bigger chains have the money to make it look like, mm -hmm. oh, this is fun, this yeah. is social. Mm -hmm. The healthier options may not have the big bucks behind them. I don't know, that's just a thought. Well, so. and also mm -hmm. to speak to um, the family with uh, parents and children running their kids through a fast food restaurant is, uh, in my world I see that's a huge matter of convenience. Mm -hmm. Family schedules are packed, mm -hmm. I mean, minute to minute to minute. We've got ballet recitals and piano practice and soccer games and, mm -hmm. you know, if you've got th two, three, four kids and you're shuttling people all over the place, there's no time to stop. There's no time to sit around a table and sit down and have a meal, which is something that I try to educate and advocate for. I try to educate parents on the importance. It sounds so simple, but it's mm -hmm. so important to sit down around a table with your children and have a meal every night, um, not only for family cohesion, but for all, also to train kids how to eat properly, how to, for proper pacing, for learning how to listen to satiation cues. Um, there's so much that can be learned around a dinner table that can't be learned in the back seat of a car with a Happy Meal. And, and in your work, that supersedes almost the choice yes. of a Happy Meal over sure. what you, right? Absolutely. Talk about that a little bit. In my world, um, there is no such thing as good food or bad food. Food is food. We don't, um, we don't pass a moral judgment on food mm -hmm. because in my world what I'm seeing is people who subscribe to good food, bad food, also caveat, healthy, unhealthy, which mm -hmm. I see, I hear people kind of yeah. swap that out a lot. Well, it's healthy. Well, it's unhealthy. I'm like, guys, that's the mm -hmm. same thing as good and bad. What happens is I become a good person if I eat these good, sure. healthy foods. And if I eat these bad foods, oh, I feel really bad. I should have done that. I'm a really bad person. I need to I need to not eat so much tomorrow to make up for this, or I need to go run a little extra or burn this off. There's there's some compensatory behavior based on caloric in, caloric intake. Um, so in my world, the words good and bad and healthy and unhealthy have to be uh, kind of eliminated. And it comes back to the relationship based on behavior and perhaps um, in some cases mindless eating, mm -hmm. yes. but in, in front of the your, television and um, mm -hmm. bag of chips, just kind of not paying attention. Yep, mm -hmm. you got it. Mm -hmm. But then in other cases, like some of the more extreme clients that perhaps you see, it's very intentional. 
but yes. it's not a healthy intent. Yes, mm. absolutely. Um, we might have some clients. Yeah, <laughs> might have some <laughs> a lot. Well, and here, here's what gets tricky: is a lot of people think that they are living a very quote unquote healthy lifestyle. Mm -hmm. I exercise this amount of time every day. I'll only eat these good foods. Mm -hmm. And what happens is they start to restrict. It's very, very, very it's still slow a disorder. Yeah, and gradual. Uh -huh. Absolutely. And it starts out. What well, a lot of people haven't heard this term, but we refer to it as orthorexic, mm -hmm. and it's folks who will only eat certain foods that they deem healthy, um, start to eliminate extras, anything they think is extra. Usually it starts with sugar and salt, things mm -hmm. like that, and then they, they move on to carbohydrates, mm -hmm. phobic. Carbohydrates make me fat. I won't eat carbs. And mm -hmm. then they'll say, well, fruit has a lot of sugar, so I won't eat any fruit. I and such so a bad gradually, bad gradually, yeah, <laughs> until they're just surviving on like coffee and gum. And what? that's, yeah. I mean, that's it. Okay. And so by the time they get to me, a lot of them have feeding tubes mm -hmm. taped to their face and they're walking with canes and they can't support their mm -hmm. frame. They started out just being healthy, but a lot of times you kind of get hijacked with that mindset, especially with uh, media. It's yeah. just glorified and praised that the thinner you are, the more esteemed you are. Um, so people are just sort of disintegrating. So how do you how do you find the balance between control, which starts out being a good thing, maybe? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going to make conscious choices, which is a form of control, sure. um, to not going to that extreme. How, where Where is the balance? I mean, anybody. I think, I think that the good food, bad food, it's true. I mean, what you want is to positively direct uh, these choices towards healthier choices. And so, like a lot of times I talk to parents about the fact that, you know, don't say what they can't do, try to suggest what they can do. So don't say you can't eat that. Mm -hmm. Let's eat this first and see if you then want that. You know, that's the thing with my kids. You know, our Halloween candy would go in a big bag, and after dinner, they could have some Halloween candy. Most of the time, they'd be so full that they then would forget about it, or they'd say, I'm really too full, I'll have it later. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. And um, that's one of the advantages, again, to having you know, the kitchen table as being where you're eating, um, and the food is kind of limited. It's better to use um, plate methods, so sit down a plate of food in front of the children um, and encourage them to eat the, the healthy things. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, if they still have room later, you know, if they've eaten that healthy food, then you know, they can have a piece of their Halloween candy. But a lot of times they don't really want it after they, mm -hmm. um, so just trying to be positive with kids. And I think again, in the beginning, if the children are allowed to make reasonable choices themselves and they learn um, how to eat reasonably, um, mm -hmm. we can, we can trust them. Um, and a lot of people don't necessarily trust their child. They're, oh, you haven't eaten enough, you know. That child knows if they're full. Sure. I um, thought one of the more telling things in the documentary was in the segment about breastfeeding, yeah. mm -hmm. where um, it, it talked about how with breastfeeding, babies control their, you know, when they're satiated, when they're mm -hmm. hungry, mm -hmm. and then we start intervening as they get older and say, oh, it's two o'clock, it must be <laughs> snack time, or, right. you know, it's six mm -hmm. o'clock, it's dinner time, yeah, it doesn't right. matter if you're hungry. Yeah, and Everybody in the pediatrician's office mind should probably kick me out. <laughs> the, mother, the baby was crying and the mother was howling. I just fed you, I just fed you. And I finally said, Mom, babies Still don't hungry. starve themselves. Mm -hmm. If he doesn't want the bottle, he won't take it. If yeah. he wants a bottle, we'll have a quiet environment. Try it. It was a young mother and she gave and she looked at me and she gave the baby the bottle and I was like, <laughs> You tried. I, just, I was saying, you know, give the baby the bottle. So yeah, it's, yeah. it's hard. And you mentioned healthy and unhealthy choices. Get into what you were saying. It's confusing. I've seen a vegan do a soft drink and an Oreo cookie, mm -hmm. and they're vegan food. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, so now we have to ask vegans, what are you really eating? Sure. What makes it a vegan, and what makes it important mm -hmm. you to do it? Because it's control. Mm -hmm. Macaroni and cheese and French fries. That's vegetarian. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's high caloric, high mm -hmm. problem issues. So it gets to both sides of the coin. So it's a. So let, let's continue that conversation to talk about what is healthy. Mm. Um, uh, uh, our, I know that you don't want to even use that description, Courtney, but <laughs> let's leave folks with some, some uh, options and some solutions that they can take from this and, and improve their relationships with food. So one of the things that we work with parents at Metro Schools with is, is really talking about 
giving children some autonomy with choice. So um, sitting down with that menu at the beginning of the month, circling you know the items that they're interested in eating, talking about why they're interested in it, um, maybe working out a schedule that makes sense in terms of yeah, you can have the hamburger on Friday and the chocolate milk, but Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I really want you to be drinking the white milk. And so have that conversation as something that they understand why you chose the, that for them or why you're wanting them to do that um, and get them to a place where they kind of start self-regulating those choices. And I think on the lunch line, it's the first it's the first chance kids can have where they're not under your thumb. Mm -hmm. They're really able to make those choices themselves. and um, it's surprising how well they do when they're given a little bit of coaching on, on how to make those decisions. Mm -hmm. Anyone else have any thoughts about what is healthy uh, eating or if there is a universal diet we should uh, seek? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's definitely healthy to eat breakfast and the lunches sure. and the breakfasts are very important for some of those kids because yeah. breakfast food is something that their families may not have. Um, reasonable breakfast choices um, sure. and it takes time in the morning and a lot of kids you know they just don't have the time to sit down so if they have that opportunity at school after they get off the bus I think that's great. Is um, it less about the, t the actual food item and more about being aware of your body and following the cues? So you said I breakfast so. I mean you didn't say eat eggs and, and toast. No just you breaking, said eat breakfast. Yeah, breaking your fast in the morning is something that people um, usually do better throughout the rest of the day if they if they eat breakfast. Um, I talk about last night's dinner being breaking the fast, eating okay. leftovers mm -hmm. at dinner time. Um, at breakfast time. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. breakfast time. Okay. So you, you have the food yeah. there. Mm -hmm. It may not be what we consider breakfast mm -hmm. food because we got into that. What is breakfast mm -hmm. food? It doesn't mm -hmm. matter what the food is. Well. Mm -hmm. Cheetos and a soft drink is not a good. Right. Uh, yeah. And I'm trying to yeah. get me trying to rethink my vocabulary here. <laughs> Cheetos <laughs> and soft drink. Ooh, too much sugar. Right, yeah. So right. eating <laughs> dinner yeah. would be a good idea. Yeah. Uh, so it's a it's a, so I, my, for me it's about balance and mm -hmm. about variety. Yes, if you're going to do a a sandwich, mm -hmm. a bologna sandwich, pork truck sandwich, pick on the good old hot dog. Mm -hmm. How about carrot and celery sticks? How about an apple with that? So it's a balance and variety okay. and not leaning too hard one way or the other. It's kind of what, and also amazing. being aware though of when you're eating. Mm. Yeah. Going back to intent, intentional. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely balance. speak to that. Yeah. I, I would encourage folks to, and you know, this is not my healthy <laughs> eating. Watch those words. I'm yeah. trying not to say that. Eating at the same time every mm -hmm. day. If you can, if you can manage to eat generally three meals and a snack or two at the mm -hmm. same time every day, you can actually, speaking to control, learn. You can you can teach your body to control the hunger fullness cues. You can train your body to get hungry at the same time every day, so mm -hmm. that you can actually plan around schedule schedules you can actually say okay well I know that from 1230 to 2 every day is kind of a lull for me I'm gonna try to eat lunch every day at that time okay so I don't have to wait and miss that meal I think that's a great uh, point to end on and I thank you so much we've run out of time I want to thank our panelists for joining us today and you can learn more about the children's health crisis in Tennessee by going to wnpt.org slash children's health and we want to hear what you think Write to us at tv8 at wnpt.org or call our viewer comment line 259-9326. Thanks for watching. Major funding for NPT Report's Children's Health Crisis is provided by the Healthways Foundation, addressing the critical issues of children's health and public education. The Nashville Healthcare Council, the HCA Foundation on behalf of TriStar Health and by members of NPT. Thank you.